guys. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, I'm going to learn the clicker here. Okay. So we're we're delighted here to represent, come here today and represent North Country. Oh. Can we ask somebody to uh, quiet the hallway? And while we're quieting the hallway, can the uh, court reporter swear everyone in? Sorry, I didn't hear you. Can you swear oh, you swear in. Do you swear the testimony about the gift? I do. All right, thanks for having us here. Um, today, I have, it takes a team to, uh, to manage a hospital, and so I have quite a few team members here. Um, represented, and um, I want to just give them a second to introduce themselves. So, Tom, you want to start? Uh, I'm Tom Frank. I'm the Chief Operating Officer. Andre Bissonnette. I'm the CFO. April Cochran, VP of Patient Care Services. Uh, Bill Perquette, Vice President of Human Resources. And then in the audience today, we have Gary Gillespie. He's our Board Vice Chair. Anita Flagg's our Controller. Adam is our Staff oh, Accountant. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I, sorry. Please speak up a little and start again. Uh, okay, we have from the we have Gary Gillespie in the uh, audience, who's our board vice president. Anita Flagg is our controller. Adam is our staff accountant, and um, and Wendy wasn't able to make it today. So, um, just a couple quick accolades for North Country Hospital to start with. Um, in 2018, we were delighted to be um, independently chosen by iVantage as one of the top 100 hospitals in the country. Uh, and then also we were um, awarded the most wired hospital for the third straight year, so 2018, 2017, and 2016. And recently, uh, this spring, we were given the Governor's Workside Wellness Gold Award. And this year's a special year for North Country Hospital. We're celebrating 100 years. We've been around for 100 years. And our original hospital still stands. You can see pictures of that. It's an apartment complex now. And you're all invited to come celebrate um, in another 100 years with us if you'd like. Um, hopefully both buildings will still be up. So you've heard, you, you continue to hear from a lot of the hospitals in our state. And um, it's true, all hospitals are, are unique, um, small and large. But overall, our industries continues to be challenged um, to remain solvent and to, to be relevant to, to remain relevant, um, to be real, relevant to our communities. Just as a reminder for North Country Hospital, our service area is roughly 30,000 um, lives. We live, we have 45 minutes to the closest critical access hospital and two hours to the, to the uh, closest tertiary hospital. And of course, we're at the border, so uh, most hospitals would have a circle around them. Um, we have a half circle when it comes to our service area. Uh, and a reminder of our structure, uh, North Country Health Systems operates North Country Hospital. Um, and uh, within that hospital, we also um, branched out and we have North, Northeast Kingdom Healthcare Collaborative, which is an LLC with St. Johnsbury. And we also offer, or we also um, operate Derby Green Nursing Home. So we have for you a presentation, I believe is very vanilla. Um, we are um, seeking uh, net patient revenue increase within the Green Mountain Care Board's guardrails. Um, in the last year, um, we have had a soft start and, um, and it's really come around with a lot of effort from the team to uh, manage finances and, um, and we've projected a gain at this point greater than $1 million in our operating margin for FY19. And um, the last, that's a significant improvement from the last two years where we've had operating margins um, for FY17 and FY18 uh, losses of $2 million each year. So we're really seeking to establish a consistent, healthy operating margin. And so um, we're pleased to put for, forth in our budget a plan to um, operate within the guardrails uh, that Green Mountain Card Care Board has requested. So our opportunities and risk, um, along with you know managing and, and reinvesting in our uh, institution, um, you've heard this time and time again, is to recruit and retain workforce. Um, we're not uh, unique with that 
that need. Um, we have market pressures on compensation. We compete nationally um, for, for our staff, and um, there is a limited availability of qualified staff. We, um, we continue to pour in additional resources into our population health um, and managing the complexities around that. Um, examples would be mental health and opiate use. And we continue to respond to the regulatory pressures at a federal and state level, uh, being the regulations regarding the critical access hospital, how we operate our 340B and our crediting bodies such as um, DMV. So um, continue with the opportunities. Um, two of the things that we have a lot of activity on currently is um, um, coming up in September, early September, we'll be meeting with our board to have strategic discussion about our service line roadmap. And um, in, in, in um, um, tandem with that, uh, on a parallel track, our physician development plan. So there's services that we are required to provide as a critical access hospital, and then there's services that we desire to provide as a um, small rural hospital. So we'll have discussions about those, what's the difference between those, um, our contribution margin of each of those, and, um, and then pair that with um, our, um, our study that we've um, recently obtained from 3 Health that helps provide insight to our demographics and what our community can support across all specialties. So um, we, like I said, we serve about 30,000 lives and understanding the demographics of that um, of, of our community helps us to understand how many primary care docs do we need, how many orthopedic surgeons can we um, support, cardiologists, urologists, all those specialties. Um, and then also acknowledging what's the, what's the retention plan of the docs that we have, the doctors that we do have. Uh, we employ 95% of the doctors. And so we want to also have awareness of doctors are, um, have retirement plans. And so looking at forward in three years, how many of those doctors will still be with us, um, working with us? And it's an honest conversation. Um, our physicians will be part of that discussion uh, in early September. Um, they complete a survey. Um, we also had, with 3D Health, we also had calls, um, cold calls to um, residents, uh, on behalf of residents, um, to our, our, um, our care practices, our primary care practices and so forth, um, just to assess how hard is it to get in to see a doc. Uh, we may say that we have an open practice, but how hard was it to, uh, to call up and say, hey, I need a, an appointment within a week. So um, we believe we have um, opportunity there to um, continue to evaluate what, how we're managing um, our uh, scheduling, but also how we're managing the, the workforce when it comes to those key drivers of our physician base. Uh, we continue to work on new staffing models to reduce cost. We have one example that's um, in the works right now with our med surge and ICU department. Um, they've been separated for years and we are converting those over to be a shared, um, a, a shared uh, workspace uh, to manage that, a, a shared uh, nurse workspace, and we'll, we'll rebrand it as a progressive care unit. Um, we have done some changes in uh, you know, our support departments. We have a revenue cycle department that's had some changes in the last year and that's resulted in some um, staff efficiency changes, which included also a decrease in one director role. We participate in programs, uh, much like many of the hospitals in Vermont, with the, the NIA, the New England Alliance for Health, through group purchasing, and um, we use that heavily with our 340B program. And then a big, a very big uh, change for our hospital in May of 2018 was the conversion to our um, all-in-one medical record, which is Athena Health. And um, that's helped with uh, increase our operating efficiencies, um, decreasing our, our op operating costs and capital costs, and, uh, and really has challenged us to um, re really look at how we're managing the patient record in an inpatient and outpatient setting. It's not perfect by any means, but um, we feel like we have a good partner with Athena Health. And through this, we've also, um, through attrition, we have been able to reduce the FTEs to support our information system. Um, that's amounted to roughly eight full-time equivalents. Um, four of those were information technology, and three were in billing, and one was in transcription. So looking at our, um, 
some of our financial indicators, uh, indicators of our health. Our operating margin when compared to U.S. critical access hospitals is slightly above. We're at 1.6%. Um, and the U.S. average is 0.9%. Our days cash on hand currently are roughly 200 plus days, and the U.S. average is 78 days. And our average age of plant is 12.7, which is higher than the average um, U.S. average of 10 and a half. And I'm going to take a break and uh, and pass it off to Andre to share some more financial information. Uh, this is our PL, the same PL that um, you guys have seen. Um, it's, you know, kind of a, a vanilla flavor, as uh, Brian discussed. The two highlights, you know, 3.4% NPR growth. And then, um, you know, we'll talk about expenses. We, we had a 2.3% expense growth. Um, the, some of the stuff that Brian just talked about enabled us to actually lower that growth rate from what we'd seen in past years. Um, we put a cash flow slide in. Um, I didn't actually put a cash flow statement in here. This is our year-end cash balances um, over um, time from 2015 to current. Um, as you can see, 2018 was low. We actually ended up dipping into or needing to dip into a line of credit in the, the last quarter of 2018 and the first quarter of 2019. Um, our cash is improving right now. Um, we have a, a much healthier status and we no longer have a balance. Uh, we were able to pay off that line of credit. It was just under $2 million. We had almost maxed it out, um, but we've actually been able to pay that off. And then our balance sheet, um, again, pretty, pretty vanilla overall. Um, our, our checking account balance basically um, has been imp improved, that top line. Uh, that's the one highlight the, that I have for the balance sheet. Uh, compensation and uh, benefits and locals and travelers have been our co cost drivers. That's uh, probably a common theme that you're, you're, you're hearing throughout the hospitals. Um, our locum expenses have definitely increased uh, this year and continue. We don't see any slowdown of that. Um, even though our, our salaries uh, as a percent of total have remained pretty constant, the locums are, are increasing. Um, these are two graphs that kind of represent um, those trends over time. As you can see, the locum expense is a percent of the total expenses. Even though they may look like small numbers, that's a pretty significant increase from where we used to be. Um, and this is just the com combined um, trend line uh, over time. Bad debt. Um, this is an item that uh, we've watched grow over the last year. Um, the 2020 bad debt is at the, the highest level that we've seen. Um, we've got some different uh, pieces that are related to that. There's the self-pay. We do have um, probably about half of our increase is related to some commercial, which is you know, our other payers, third-party payers. Um, Blue Cross, uh, we still have some um, claims out there from their, their uh, transition January 1st. Uh, we have some claims in Medicaid that are in a su suspense status, uh, some denied claims that had to be reworked from Medicare, and then a few commercials. Um, so that's about half of it. The other half is our self-pay. Um, self-pay, we do, we, we try not to send self-pay to collection to bad debt. We tr try to work with our self-pay patients um, to get them on a payment plan if possible, uh, if they can't pay that, ba that bill in full. That's uh, just under $2 million is what we have in our self-pay uh, payment plan balances right now. Uh, the question on uh, projections, do they hold uh, from where we, uh, when we initially submitted our budget? Our 2019 projected um, is roughly 1.4 million. Um, year to date June, our actual was $709,000 uh, on our bottom line. The budget was 408. Um, the budget for total year of 19 was 900. So yes, um, we believe our projections are actually going to exceed a little bit um, currently from when our projections were submitted. Uh, this is the graphical representation. This is where we were um, over the course of the year. As you can see in December, we bottomed out. 
Um, we were losing almost $2 million. We put a plan in place to turn that around. Um, that's the blue line. The black line is our year-to-date budget trend, and we can see that that blue line is tracking above um, our budget trend, and um, we just closed July out, and that trend's pretty much holding um, at the same level. So more of the hospital story, um, when it comes to one care, um, we made the decision this year to, to jump into two um, payers. So we've been, we're um, our, in our third year of the Medicaid risk contract, and, um, and we've done favorably with the, with the Medicaid program. Uh, so we've jumped into commercial with the Blue Cross um, for the, the future 2020 year. And um, I would say that I, I, I need to give accolades to, to, to Tom, um, Tom Frank and his team because what they've been working on with our primary care has really prepared for us uh, to, to be in the ACO um, years in advance. And we have a strong medical home model that's payer blind. And, um, and we op we've operated in that environment for, um, for quite a few years. And I believe it was that work ahead of time that helped us to have an ease um, ease within the Medicaid um, ACO um, and so uh, we attribute that to ongoing good work from the past we um, we do have um, you know growing concerns with um, uh, what it takes to continue to be in the in the product and we're um, we continue to support that we do have dual reporting requirements for um, for that ACO and so that requires um, extra work on our staff, but we are um, we're handling that in-house. And, um, and then when it comes to just understanding the ACO, it's important, I think, to remember that uh, it's a shared risk. So um, although the hospital, our hospital performed well and, and received its full risk return, um, because it's a shared pool and not all hospitals performed um, at that top level, our hospital um, ended up getting a decrease from um, the overall um, expected um, re reward for being in the program. And that amounted to roughly about $100,000, $90,000, and it's still estimates right now. Um, so we support being in it together and um, what the ACO is about, but it's just an illustration of it does take investment, um, whether a hospital's performing well or not in the program, and it takes quite a few years, and I think Again, good work to the team here of the years past to prepare for us, but there is a lag time in, um, in, in um, working with, the, uh, with those ACO products. So, um, so we talked about um, you know, our soft start to the year and put in some measures to, to rebound from that. And we also measure our, the productivity of our staff with a, pro with a program called Premier, um, and that's a labor tool that allows us to compare our organization to um, hospital departments of similar size and scale. And uh, right now, we, we try to be in the 90 to 110% productivity range. Um, and so right now, as a hospital as a whole, we're 105% productive. The 340B, 340B contract uh, management is um, another tool that's added revenue to the um, operating margin and, uh, and has worked well for us. Um, I think like many of the hospital project pro products, um, you can make or break your bottom line by one component. Um, 340B could, um, if it went away, would, um, would break our bottom line. Um, so we're always balancing all these scales. Uh, we are exploring a retail pharmacy because um, in our environment we have most of our primary care settings and, and physicians um, specialties on campus. So we believe that there's an opportunity to capture um, and uh, capture some retail pharmacy business. Um, developing staff, we host um, the Vermont Technical Institute um, program uh, at, our at, our, at our site and developing feature staff through, through that program. Again, the, the New England Alliance for Health um, offers us uh, savings with um, group purchasing through supply chain, the pharmaceuticals, there's an education module um, called Elsevier that we use to onboard 100% uh, of our people for annual compliance. And, um, and then we also use a uh, 340B auditor through the, this, the, this shared program that, uh, that 
that we benefit from. We've, through the course of the last one to two years, have done facility upgrades on energy efficiency. Right now we calculate that's about a $40,000 a year savings in our uh, efficiencies. Uh, and I've already talked about Latina Health. A reminder of how we collaborate, um, much like many of the hospitals in the state, we collaborate with UVM specifically. We collaborate on outpatient hemodialysis, a nephrology clinic, clinical pathology, um, a physician supplied through that program, uh, neonatal intensive care and transport, collaboration with OB quality initiatives. And then with Dartmouth, uh, we, we participate with them on a stroke and STEMI collaboratives. Uh, they supply um, through a con con contractual relationship our cardiologists. Um, oncology is a venture that we, um, we um, support out of St. Johnsbury. Uh, telemedicine and teleneuro, telepsych, telepharmacy, uh, the list goes on and on. And, uh, and of course, the group purchasing that's um, known as MEAC. We collaborate to, to make our environment a healthier, stronger place um, locally. So we partner with the FQHC, Northern Counties Healthcare. Um, just several years ago, we provided 100,000 seed money to open a dental clinic in Orleans. Uh, Northeast Kingdom Human Services, um, we, we use their psychiatrist to embed in our, in our primary care setting uh, with a, a physician and a, um, a nurse practitioner. North Vermont Regional Hospital partners in our LLC. Currently, we're providing the sleep lab services. Uh, we provide our general surgery coverage to Upper Connecticut Valley Regional Hospital um, uh, because they don't, there's a, they're a very, very small hospital and have a need, so we're able to send a general surgeon out there um, roughly one day a week and provide services there. And then uh, we also have a, a long-standing orthopedic surgeon that, um, that comes part-time. We have one full-time on our own, but we have one from Littleton um, that comes. So our capital budget is a spend of 3.6 in our uh, budget, and it's funded through operating cash. Uh, we put that on freeze earlier this year when we had a soft start, um, but we still, um, it's important to continue to maintain um, a fiscally sound um, institution with, uh, with your infrastructure. So uh, we continue to push forward with that, that spend. Uh, it amounts to about 2.3 million in medical equipment, uh, almost 900,000 in technology, and about 400,000 in facilities. And uh, one of our other big projects that we're, uh, we're wrapping up is our facility master plan and uh, looking at what, what work we need to what work is ahead of us that we need to consider for the moder modernization planning of our campus. Um, as I said earlier, our age of our infrastructure is a couple years older than the U.S. average, and we need to continue to keep line of sight to protecting and, um, and reinvesting in, in the physical structure. The, uh, the Medicare ACO, um, I shared that we're in two of the three project products. For us, it would be an additional $1.2 million risk to be in the, in the Medicare portion. Uh, there's, still, there's still a lot of work to, to, um, to sort through on critical access hospital status as it relates to uh, being involved into, in a capitated um, program such as the Medicare ACO. Um, once we, we want to make sure that we position ourselves to continue with um, a hold harmless with the critical access hospital reimbursement and um, we're not part of a, uh, a system and um, we don't want we're, right now we're just um, we're reluctantly optimistic um, about that work and supportive but uh, we, we want to make sure that we know um, as cost reports settle out which usually take a couple years how that um, how CMS is going to interpret that. And so we're pleased to hear about the work that the ACO is putting in that, even as of last week. Uh, we have, uh, we expect, you know, locums, as Andre illustrated, that's going to continue to be a problem, w whether it's physician or nursing staff. We have started to work uh, internationally in recruiting staff. Um, and so we have one nurse on site now and about six more coming through the course of the next uh, four or five months that will be onboarded. These are positions we've posted for um, um, numerous months. 
um, to no success, and and so we're tr attempting to fill the gap with it um, with this program. I've already talked about the facility master plan. You're not blacking out, <laughs> <laughs> but you might. Know, speaking of infrastructure. <laughs> Um, so I, I won't go through the master plan activity again, that's, that's redundant. Um, and I, I did mention again that the, the medical uh, mo home model that we have is pair blind. We're doing that, that work on all high risk and very high risk patients regardless of um, what payer they're with or even if they're self pay. Um, and then uh, again, the physician development plan is a key a driver for um, the next three, three years, what we see um, and the development of our medical staff, maintaining the medical staff we have, but also um, really coming to grips with what our population's needs are and meeting that. This is the uh, total cost of care. Um, as you can see, our area in Newport is, is one of the lowest at 2.9 for growth rate, um, and also the 479 um, below the, a the state average. Um, so this is, uh, I think, a, a big positive for our area. Um, and this is from the blueprint. Um, now we're in a, the bottom left quadrant, which is where um, we want to be. Um, I think this goes back to what Brian also talked about with the medical home model and the blueprint that we've been doing for um, many years. Um, so it's not a, a one or two year endeavor. It's been going on for a while. I think that's had a huge impact on, on these members. Um, and then as far as being in compliance with past budget orders, uh, North Country Hospital has been in compliance with past budget orders, so we didn't see any, any issues with that. So like I said, our presentation, I believe, is very vanilla. That's that's for you to judge. Um, and uh, thanks for your consideration um, of our budget, and we are prepared to um, answer your questions. Super. We're going to start with Board Member Lund. Thank you. Um, I was wondering uh, if you could, so let me back up and tell you why I'm so interested. As you may know, uh, there's a Rural Health Service task force that was established by the legislature to report back in January. Um, I'm the chair of that task force. And um, what the task force is charged with is looking at sustainability of our rural health care system in Vermont. So I was very interested to hear that you're embarking on a, your service line roadmap and your physician development plan. And I wonder if you could just speak uh, in a little more detail about what goes into that what kind of considerations do you look at? I know you mentioned demographics, but if you could just go into that in a bit more detail. Sure. Um, so we, for the last several months, we engaged, like I said, with an organization called 3D Health. And um, it starts with a survey. First, actually, it starts with a uh, conversation about defining our service area, making sure that we understand uh, where our patients, um, what we believe, draw from. And um, so we, we predominantly are Essex and Orleans County. And, um, but th then also understanding um, where does overlap, over, you know, hospitals overlap that. And so there's a primary and a secondary area that we, we um, seek to understand. We also, um, we also have a conversation in regards to, um, you know, a population of 30,000 roughly. Um, we have to understand that 100% of those people aren't going to access health care. Sure. I mean, um, there's, there's people that need to, and there's people that um, they're not going to access it until, um, you know, it's apparent that they need it. Um, and that's, that's part of the challenge rolling back to the ACO is making sure that we identify the people that need it before they sometimes understand that they need it. Um, but um, then, um, so then we, once we set the guardrails, the parameters for that, uh, we had, um, we, we included a medical staff. We did a short survey. It took them three to four minutes to complete. Um, we had greater than 50% participation, if not more. And they, they tell us 
um, what do they, through all specialties, what do they hear from patients or what do they believe are the needs um, for, the, um, for, for their patients that they, that they interact with. So we get their perception and what they hear. And then, um, and then we look at national data, um, or 3D Health does, looks at national data, and they look at, based on the demographics of your population, when I say demographics, it's male, female, age groups, um, you know, income level, understanding them at a deeper level and um, what their potential. So if we have a higher um, senior population, we need to understand that they're gonna access healthcare differently than the zero to 17. Um, so, so that all rolls in together to, to populate um, based on that, those, those populations and the demographics of what across each subspecialty um, you can, you can um, support. So we, um, this is preliminary, but we believe that we um, have validated that we need to recruit and retain one additional primary care doctor, um, and that's already been on our recruitment plan. Um, cardiology what has been an area where um, we've been short and we've been providing historically maybe two to three days and uh, the surprise for us somewhat of a surprise is we we really could support up to two cardiologists full-time um, and we use that as a, a validation for um, when we look at recruiting and, and resources and putting that in knowing that we can fill a full-time position and keep them busy and it's serving the population. Um, and uh, so we pair that together um, and also, um, come, am, I, am, I, am I hitting the points that you'd like me to hit? Yes, this is great. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, I don't want to be too long-winded. They might turn the lights out again. <laughs> um, That's so, Del, Mike Del Treca, so we'll see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so I guess what I'm trying to illustrate is it's fairly detailed. Yeah. It's a three-year plan. Um, and um, by the end of our September meeting, we will be on the same page with, and I'm not saying we weren't, but it validates, okay, if we're gonna spend resources, we know that it's in the right spots. Uh, we're not gonna recruit for a you know, full-time position that our community can only support, say, 0.25 or you know, a half a position, so 0.5. So. Have you, or how would you uh, think about factoring in uh, the payment and delivery system changes and how that impacts on uh, that roadmap. So we know based on the specialty what is um, what is revenue producing, um, such as like a surgical uh, physician is going to you know generate business uh, most likely with um, a, 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 a higher contribution margin, but a psychiatrist. On the other hand, as more of a support services. So, um, what part of our conversation will be um, in September is the understanding um, that when we, for psychiatrists, for example, um, our primary care physicians are already, are already they they fill the gap of so many shortcomings of, of what we can't recruit and retain. So, whether it's urology or cardiology or psychiatry, that's really the catch-all. And so what we can do is make sure we understand if we invest in some of those, I'll call support FTEs, um, physician categories, that lifts the load from primary care and allows them to practice primary care. So, um, um, so uh, they, they can focus on uh, what they do best and the physician that we hire can focus on what they do best. self-pay other revenue assumptions. Um, commercial insurance revenue estimates should include the latest assumptions. Um, and your answer was that there were no significant changes for commercial reimbursements other than people opting out of health care due to uh, the individual mandate penalty, which I found interesting because you were the only hospital who mentioned that. Uh, and 
what we've seen in the enrollment numbers in Vermont Health Connect statewide was no change. So I was just curious, uh, your data source for that, or whether that's more anecdotal stories you're hearing, because it, was, it wasn't it was outlier in terms of the information that we've received elsewhere. Yeah, that was a little more anecdotal, um, Robin. Um, we have six navigators um, that help people get enrolled both in the both QHP products, but as well as Medicaid. Um, and they've seen a little bit, of, it's not huge, but they have seen a little bit of a shift. Thank you. Um, I think that's what I have. Thank you, Robin. Tom? <coughs> Thank you. I uh, <coughs> spent some time up at North Country Hospital a little while ago, and it was, uh, I tell you, all these hospitals, as I think I said on my tour, if, it, if you dropped me into the middle of it and asked me to how to get out, um, it would be impossible there. <laughs> it's, it's, it's such a matrix. It's, uh, um, but the drive up is lovely. Um, so my first question has to do um, with some, uh, some of the data that was in the updated Bridges document uh, that, that you pr presented. And it shows, um, it profiles a decrease of 5.6 million in Medicaid NPR from 13.1 million to uh, 29 uh, in 2019 budget to 7.4 um, million in 2020 budget, essentially a flat Medicaid revenue and an increase in commercial from of 11.4 million from 37.1 million to 48.6 million, and these seem like big movements to me. Um, and the reference on the, on, the, on the Bridges document was mostly that this was attributable to changes in payer mix. And so I'm just wondering if you can comment on that. Um, not really without digging into the data. Um, are you looking at budget to budget or actual to budget from 18? Um, I am looking at a, um, a, t a 2019 budget to 2020 budget. Um, yeah, other than that, there may have been a shift from what we had initially budgeted for 19 to actual because we build our budget for 20 off of our current run rate. Um, so that's without actually digging into that deeper, that's the only thing that I have right now. Okay. Um, <clears throat> my next is uh, looking at bad debt, the bad debt trend. Um, it's uh, uh, since 2018, it's been on a kind of a 46%. Uh, growth rate and the free care has grown at about 10 percent and I'm just wondering how you're managing uh, the relationship between those two programs. Yeah, the, the free care, um, I'll kind of answer two different answers. The free care, um, like, again, we have uh, six navigators that um, progressive probably may not be the right word, but um, go after and try to get our self-pay patients enrolled um, either in free care or in Medicaid or in the one of the QHP products, we have a number of different avenues and touch points with our patients because we do have six navigators. Um, hopefully they can get, get those people on free care. Um, those people who are not willing to come in and apply for free care would end up, the, the AR would age out and become bad debt. So I don't know if that fully answers your question. Um, that's the relationship between the two. Um, I, a lot, of, a lot of times look at it as one big bucket because it falls generally to self-pay. Um, and we try to manage that so we can get it, capture as many of those patients in either, again, one of those three, three products. Um, does that answer your question? Yes. Um, I noticed on Appendix 9, and I think, I think this was discussed last year a little bit, but on Appendix 9, which is the kind of salary profile, um, uh, you uh, have the position of being uh, the highest percentage of total salaries in the $300,000 and, um, and above categories um, at 23.6%. Uh, and I think I have a recollection that we discussed that at one point, and a lot of it had to do with longevity and the just the you know people kind of coming and working at North Country and liking it there and staying there and this accrues over time as opposed to kind of starting salaries. Um, uh, I'm, so I'm just wondering if you can comment on that. Yeah, my only other, my only comment on that would be that part of it and I think the other part is the fact that we employ 96% of our physicians right now. Um, so that also changes your 
percentage as opposed mm -hmm. to if we only employed 50% of our physicians. Mm -hmm. um, and again, uh, uh, on utilization, um, I'm, I'm looking at uh, 2019 projected over 2018 actual. Um, there just seems to be some you know, fairly dramatic movements there in terms of adjusted admissions are down 14.4%, acute admissions down 24.2%, while acute average length of stay and operating room procedures were up 36% and 15% respectively. So I'm just wondering if you can comment on that kind of remixing of those metrics. Um, but yeah, the, the comment I had, I'll have is um, we started out this year and we ended last year, um, kind of when we came to our re, uh, rebasing meeting in March, where we had a really weird shift in our volumes coming in. Our ER had decreased, which had the flow through the rest of the organization, particularly inpatient. That had decreased, um, but our OR had increased. Um, we're, um, I think we're utilizing our, our surgeons, they're, they're much busier mm -hmm. um, than what they had been. Um, and our diagnostic imaging, we continue, continue to see some uh, additional volumes in our CT program, particularly um, revolving around our low dose lung screening for lung cancer. Um, not just the volumes are there, but we're also catching a lot of lung cancer a lot earlier than what used to be uh, caught, which is uh, very beneficial to the patients. So those are the two really almost opposing um, utilization issues that are going on right now. And uh, my last question is under uh, <coughs> other operating income you have, uh, I'm sorry, under other operating expenses, there's a line called other non-salary expenses and that is up from 21.8 million in 2019 budget to 25.3 million in 2019, uh, 2019 projected. Um, so I'm just, you know, so what is other non-salary expense? Yeah, the driver to that one, um, which I think we answered in our narrative, was um, where we classified the locum expenses. In the 2019 budget, they were actually up in the, the salary area and in the actual for 18 and the projected and budget for 20, they're down in the other category. So that's the major difference. Yeah, it's JD, the so, uh, I see. Yeah. Um, and I might have one more quick one here. Um, in terms of fringe benefits for doctors, budgeted in 2019 at 1.16 uh, million, but now it's uh, <coughs> 1.8 million. And then for 2020 budget, it's back to 1.17 million. So there's just this one one year bump in there, but it's a big bump, and I'm just curious about it. I'm not 100 percent sure what's driving that. Um, I can look into that and okay. get that. Okay, it's a, all you have to do is you can look on your operating statement. Um, you just it's the um, fringe benefit MD line item. It's got a one year bump, but you, you can take a look at it and shoot me an email. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, great. Um, first, it's really good to see the turnaround that you guys have are showing this year. You know, from going to a negative, I think, 200,000 or about flat in operating margin in 16, and then a negative 1.8 in 17, and negative 1.8 in 18. This certainly was a hospital that was of great concern last year to be able to, you know, see that turnaround. Um, I have a couple questions on your income statement, if you could just maybe pull that up and uh, I think really I was just trying I did have the same question Tom had about the fringe benefits maybe that's something you know definitely to look at because that's giving you about 700,000 of favorability from your projection to but from your projection in 19 to your budget in 20 um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, the other operating revenue, and I think you alluded to this before as far as, you know, the 340B, and that's really driving, it looks like, the big changes through your P&L and the improvements. Um, and your budget, I guess you went from 18 actual of 5.1 million to a budget of 6.7, and then you actually came in, you're coming in at 7.1, so that's great. And then in 20, it's going back down by 700,000 and just wanted to talk about, you know, is there any opportunity there to get that back equal to where you are for your 
forecast right now. Um, for the other operating revenue? Yes. I'm assuming that's probably a 340B, a large part of it. Uh, that, that's a piece of it. Um, we also had, um, we do have grant revenue that goes through there, um, and that has decreased. Um, part of the decrease, we had a, a grant, it was last year, for what ended up, was it rehab? Journey to recovery. Basically for um, recovery and uh, addiction. That grant moved over to an uh, agency that started up about a year and a half ago called Journey to Recovery. Um, they are actually utilizing that grant for, um, for um, addiction recovery. Uh, and we actually are con have contracted with them to have coaches come into our ER. So even though it's a decrease on a revenue line for us, um, it's going back at least into our community and that's coming in. So that's one of the decreases in revenue and the other operating revenue. Okay. Um, <clears throat> one of the larger ones. And then just want to talk a little bit about the ACO reserves and how you guys are rolling that through both for 19 um, and then again for 20. So I'm, I'm assuming it's about the same each year, right? About 375. And, right. you know, where do you see you'll be ending in 20 um, with your reserves? Well, in 20, well, let me go back. In, in 18, we closed the year and we, we, were, we closed it fair, favorably for those reserves. So the plan is to kind of keep those reserves in there and roll them forward. Um, you know, hoping or assuming that that continues on um, for 20 that we'll still have reserves in there where we don't, won't have to take, if anything, out of our operations to bolster those reserves. So for 20, are you, you're not putting in an additional 375 yeah. or so to put it back? Yeah. Okay, good. All right. And um, I'll add to that, that that because we did well in Medicaid, it created that op optimal opportunity where we could keep the reserves and um, um, net it against with, with the, re the re rebate reward, um, we could use that to offset the new reserves that we have to create for the commercial. So um, our hope is that those will flatten each other out, balance each other out, so neither going into the, the second product will not hit our, our um, operating margin. Good. Yeah. I, you know, we'll, we'll all see as we go th down through this process, but I, I think that seems reasonable because you guys had already built your reserve, some reserves in 19. Um, and are you able to track within the hospital kind of the trailing fee for service that you have for the ACO patients that you handle within your hospital and how that reconciliation is working? Um, you're talking like for the shadow claims? Yeah, I mean just to understand like within your hospital even for those, for those attributed lives that actually come to the, your hospital for services you know whether that's tracking favorably unfavorably because obviously you have to cover the participation fees and some other fees yeah. out of what you might be getting yeah we currently can't track the shadow claims um, medicaid does have a methodology so that um, they can identify them but in our current system we, we we aren't able to track those those claims that's something that i think going forward into next year we're going to see if we can have something built in our system so we can track those because it's almost real time, where right now the information we're getting is from one care and there is a lag to it. So, um, you know, I couldn't tell you what our last two month shadow claims were, but for the first quarter, um, we can probably get that information. Oh, it's just something for yeah. you, you know, for you as far as looking at. Yeah. And can you talk a little bit about your cost savings programs and your alliances that you have, I think with NEH and different areas that, you know, what's your philosophy on the cost savings? Um, some of the cost savings we, uh, with NIA alone, uh, we've had a supply chain savings last year of just under $300,000. Um, that was a, a big one. Um, facilities, we put in um, facility-wide, we changed all of our lights out. Um, and just from the energy usage alone, we estimated, as Brian said, about $40,000 by putting LEDs in. Um, on top of that savings, which we haven't even actually calculated, is we were changing um, every week Every day, our facilities guys would go around for an hour um, changing light bulbs. Um, not the best use of our, our higher end facility guys. So you have a recycling uh, kind of embedded component there as well as um, buying new light bulbs plus your energy costs. Um, those are some, some of the larger ones. Uh, cost containment, we've um, 
as Brian said, we've eliminated uh, almost four positions in our revenue cycle through attrition, or three through revenue cycle, four through IT. Um, so that's staff reductions um, because of our, our new EHR system. Um, those, are, those, are, those are the larger ones. And, and then it's just continually looking at our contracts, um, which Nia has also helped us with, um, not just supply chain, but contract savings. Um, getting a, a better pricing on our contracts. Okay. And then this one I think we'll probably have to follow up on because I, I too is looking at the change in commercial as a percentage of your revenue. And some of the reports that are generated through our system in the end of 2018, actual was about 43%. And then in 19, it went up to about 47%. And then in 20, it's, it's actually not consistent with the number, the big increase again, but just really making sure we understand that shift to commercial payers, because that seems like a pretty big jump and you weren't getting it, you know, really through commercial rate increases. So I think we can talk about it offline. I can show you what I'm looking at, but it, it's really just to see, to make sure, you know, your assumptions are in line with what's really gonna happen, because obviously if you assume more in, in the commercial, and if it doesn't occur, you, you'll be lower reimbursed by the other payers. So I just want to kind of look yep. at that assumption to yep. make sure that's valid. But I can show you the information after. Okay. But thank you. Yep. Okay, Jess. Okay. Uh, so I actually, too, want to congratulate you on the turnaround. Um, I can show you a lot of effort from your whole team. Thank you. Back, back at the ranch. Um, and I also just wanted to add, you know, I did a recent tour. You remember, and one of the things that I walked away with was an incredible impression of your primary care practices and the building and the patient flow and all, and how you manage that. And so I think, to some degree, I do think that your success in the Medicaid model is built on the foundation of having a really strong medical home. Um, and I hope, I wish you success in the Blue Cross Blue Shield. I'm happy to see that you're jumping into that uh, pool too. And I would say, I hope that you can be uh, unreluctantly optimistic about Medicare because I do believe, and I think some of the information is, is hopefully coming out, getting out to the hospitals, the critical access hospitals, but there is work being done by the ACO, by the Green Mountain Care Board, and by our partners at CMMI to, uh, uh, you know, hold harmless through the Medicare and have more information about how the Medicare cost reports are going to affect you in a fixed payment world or in, a, in this model. So I uh, wanted to just hope for unreluctant optimism on that front. Uh, I'm like Robin. I'm, I'm I'm curious about this service line roadmap, and in particular, what struck me, which was interesting, was the, the assessment. I think it's a great idea, and I, I hope all hospitals do it. And it's, it's in line with some of the questions that I've been trying to ask many of the hospitals around: what is the appropriate services that hospitals should be offering? Um, and one of the things that you said, though, was that the you know you're trying to figure out. We know what is revenue producing. We know uh, what the contribution margin would be of some of these service areas. And I was struck by that because I, we had asked uh, in some of our Q&A for the hospitals to share the departments where expenditures exceed revenues and where departments where revenues are exceeding expenditures to try and figure out where are the margins, the positive margins, and where are the negative margins, where are the service lines in your terminology, and where are the revenue producers. And your answer was that you could not provide that information. So I'm trying to figure out if you couldn't provide the information, but yet you're doing this service, you know, uh, assessment, service roadmap. How do, how are you figuring that out? And how can we ask that? I guess my sense is we probably asked the question in the wrong way. We're trying to get at exactly what you're doing, and understand that at each hospital. So how can we ask that question in a better way so that you could provide that information? I'll start, and then Andre can clean up. That. Sure. Um, so the contribution margin is in an all-in. Uh, uh, it doesn't have all the costs of the organization in. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we part, well, BKD, our auditors, help um, provide this assessment. Um, it's one way to look at, um, at, at on our service lines. So all of the overhead expenses aren't in there. So, um, you know, that drives that, that margin down. So what we try to do with um, in this work is just identify, um, so for example, um, Orthopedics might show a contribution margin of two million dollars, mm -hmm. but when you put in all the other costs of support, it may be far less than that. Um, so it's just a starting point to say, okay, what? 
how are these services doing and helps us out um, really line the site to there's outpatient practices and and that's not in there so um, when we look at uh, primary care we know that that feeds you know those service lines such as general surgery and OB and so forth inpatient care so those are all components so um, so it's just one way of looking at it it's not a it's not a full accounting of the income and expenses for that 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 service line um, so just to just to clarify that that tool that we're using isn't yeah. isn't maybe what you think it is uh, no 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 I'm just yeah. I'm in some sense the tool that you're using or the methodology that you're using is exactly what I was hoping we would better understand not necessarily a strict accounting but we know for example that birthing centers lose money right Springfield disclosed their birthing center because they were losing money we know that orthopedics tends to generate revenue that's why most hospitals want an orthopedic practice so we have some sense of where the revenue producers are and where some of the you know cost centers are but not across all service lines and so what you're trying to do at your hospital I think it's really important and it's something information that we're trying to get a little bit of a handle on here as we look across the hospital network. So I'm not sure how to ask the question in a way that doesn't require a strict accounting of overhead and how you yeah. allocate costs, but how to get a sense of what are the areas where we realize this, is, this may not make money, but it's, it's providing a service and generating revenue in other places and complementary services or things like that. So that's, I think, what we were trying to ask. And so I was curious about this through your process. And maybe we'll think about a better way to ask it. If you have advice, I would welcome it. Yeah. Um, but again, in that, my second question was related to that. Are you looking at, and this is again, my, a little bit of my theme for the last couple of days, but my concern about very small hospitals with small uh, populations is of course volume. So when you're thinking about what is the appropriate service mix in your new plan, are you looking at minimum volume standards or things like that that would say, hey, we know that there's a relationship between the number of cases and the quality of outcomes and if we want to factor that into our mapping? I'm calling April Star. Okay. So that's an excellent question. We've been having robust discussions with our um, medical staff quality group and our medical exec group about that specific thing. And then how much is under the purview of medicine and surgery, how much is under the purview of us as senior leadership saying, wait, we need to we need to you know have a minimum standard. So um, We've been having discussions about, especially with the surgeons, what are transferable skills. So they may be um, that they're not doing certain procedures a lot, but it's a skill in that procedure that they use all the time in another procedure. So, so it's a it's this kind of delicate balance between medicine and those minimum standards. But we also want to drive the, our quality metrics, and we need a certain amount to have statistical significance about whether the um, you know the uh, complication rate is accurate. I mean, it's also very hard when you look at all of the um, medical associations to find um, where they say that the standards are. It's very, very difficult. No, so I've been looking, actually. It, yeah, it's little. almost impossible to yeah. find any, any standards um, out there for that. But that we are in uh, big conversations about that. Our surgeons backed off in the last two or three years from doing as much vascular surgery because of that, because they didn't have the volume and the risk was too high with small volumes. And there may be, I mean, I've been looking a little internationally, so for example, Germany won't let anybody do less than 50 knee replacements a year, so that's something that Germany has you know, mm -hmm. put in their law. So I don't know if there's, I've been looking elsewhere to say, what should this look like? Um, can you just talk a little bit about, um, you mentioned in there uh, $250,000 for community health expense to improve population health. Do you have a sense of what that might look like? as you're jumping into the <coughs> ACL model and thinking about population health? So it's a placeholder. Okay. Um, so there's not, it, it's, I would say it's for innovation. Um, we wanted to build that. So um, there's things in our community that um, we are either a part of or not a part of that we want to get involved in and help um, other organization, organizations continue their good work. So in the area of child care, for example, there is recently an opportunity where um, there's a collaborative of um, multi a few organizations coming together to provide a service to, um, to some youth and also um, um, a service to moms and, um, and it, it's called um, Northeast Kingdom Lear Learning Services. I think it's Learning Services. 
And so it's a collaborative of um, local and federal grants to start this program. I wish I can't, I can't speak um, confidently about it, but that's something that we have volunteered some dollars to to support as an example. Um, rather than us being the insti instituting it, we can, we can provide some resources to that. So, um, so we're, we're looking at how we can use that for innovation um, to, to get involved in, in the good work in our community as, it, as we see it advancing community health rather than starting it all by, you know, from the hospital. Uh, no, that's great. That's yeah. great answer. Um, my last question is just about the HCA, HCA asked a question about the ratio of commercial payer reimbursement to Medicare reimbursement. And I thought it was an interesting question, and many of the hospitals have answered it. Um, you directed us to your financial statements, but it would be helpful for me to hear directly from you. Uh, if on average Medicare pays $100 for a particular service, what would your commercial payers on average <coughs> reimburse for that same service? Yeah. And if you have to get back to me on that, that's totally fine. I just really wanted to hear from you directly what. Yeah, I can get back to you, but I think, you know, off the top of my head, if Medicare pays 100 a commercial is probably paying in the 160 okay. Thank you range. very much. So, um, do you believe your technology issues of the past are behind you? Uh, technology issues are never going to end. Um, it's a continuing saga as we move forward. Um, what we've tried to do is mitigate that and sort of slow down the process of where we struggle with technology. Um, we've been very fortunate that um, we've had an excellent team of folks. Um, as you saw, we were the most wired to get for the third year in a row. We do our best to utilize technology to help with patient care, but that's constantly changing. By going to Athena, we've run into some challenges with respect to what they're able to do on the inpatient side, but what they've been able to do is partner with us. They've been helping us from an efficiency perspective, and we do now have one medical record, which obviously is a huge benefit. But they're not behind us, but I'd say at least right now we're, we're level. Okay. Is Derby green in the black? No. Could you tell us by how much? Uh, currently, they're losing almost two hundred thousand dollars. Okay. And on the uh, four point two percent, how did you determine that 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 was the appropriate change in uh, charge request and? What methodology did you use to allocate that change in charges to your service lines? And will the allocation with a, a weighted average equal out to um, that change in charge request? Um, I'll start with your second question first. The allocation is we apply 0% fee increase to our practices, and it was 5% to all other service lines. So that one's pretty straightforward. Um, as far as coming up with the fee increase, we look at what our um, inflated expenses are, or change of expenses, look for what we want to have for a bottom line, and then work that into what our net patient revenue ceiling is and come up with a fee increase. So there's no increase to uh, any of the physician practices? No. Okay. And the 5% is across all other lines? Yeah. Okay. Okay, I, I think that's all the questions that I have. Can I ask a quick follow-up? Certainly. Um, on the, your professional fees, is that because you're usually on a fee schedule and not percentage of charge? Yeah, it's um, two, two reasons. That's the, the major one. Most of the payers are fee schedule and with our primary care, um, they're on um, per visit based on either Medicaid or Medicare. So it doesn't change what we're actually going to get. And we, you know, a long time ago, we took into consideration if we're going to have patients coming in, at least for initial visits, and if they happen to be self-pay, that's one way of trying to help them out. Okay, so at this time, I'm going to turn it over to the healthcare advocate, Julia Shaw. Thank you.
Um, so as you might be aware, our office has started reviewing hospitals' uh, patient financial assistance policies. Um, we focus so far largely on the largest hospitals, but we have done a little bit of analysis on uh, bad debt and free care and small hospitals as well. Uh, so I just wanted to share that based on our analysis, your free care is about uh, two percent of your revenue, and your ratio of free care to bad debt is about 0.5 to one, so 50 cents of free care for a dollar of bad debt. Um, and those are both around average for the state. Um, so I welcome you to comment on either those numbers if you wish. Um, and then I just have a couple of follow-up questions. I'm wondering if you can comment on your bad debt number for 2017 and um, what happened in that year, because it looks like it's an outlier and on par with your free care for that one year. I don't remember what happened in seventeen. <laughs> Other than that, it did it did go down. Um, I'd have to dig into that to see why it, it actually dropped. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, in your presentation, you also said something about um, Medicaid claims in relation to your bad debt number. And I didn't quite follow what you were saying. Yeah, and, and bad and bad debt um, and in free care, we we have a reserve amount for any AR that's outstanding, uh, and we reserve for anything over 120 days. So that's one component, and then we'd have AR that we would actually write off or, or send out to collections. That would be bad debt. The the Medicaid common is what's in our AR that's over 120 days that's aging out. So we reserve for that as bad debt. So that's something you built to Medicaid and have in your receipt. Correct. Mm -hmm. 